So you're six rounds through your fantasy draft. You're yet to have drafted a wide receiver. Number one, what are you doing? Number two, I know what you're doing. You've come to the right place. You've come to the right video because this video is five must draft wide receivers in fantasy football in round seven or later. So you forgot to draft wide receivers. Therefore, you need to figure out which guys are going to supplement that type of team. That's what this video is about. We're going to go through five of the best picks in round seven or later at the wide receiver position. We also did that for the running back position on Tuesday. That'll be linked down below. Make sure you go check that video out either before or after, but make sure you come by and hit this one. Now, we talked about in Tuesday's video, running back more of like a strategy type of thing. The easiest correlation between running back fantasy points and the position, right? Like in itself, fantasy points and running backs is just volume. The number of touches a running back gets, obviously the higher the fantasy point total they are going to have at the end of the year. Now, wide receivers, any any position is obviously the same. However, it's a little bit different at wide receiver in the fact that uh, let me let me give an example, I guess, or the way my thought process is going with this. I was on a uh, podcast earlier this week called the Caps Off Podcast. If you're a foot, if you're on football talk, if you're on football TikTok, you've probably seen or heard of this podcast, right? Caps Off Podcast. They had me on as a guest, and one of the questions that they asked me was, if you had to name any player or players in the NFL that are really overvalued due to their fantasy success, who would that be? And I started thinking about the question, right? Like guys who have been really, really good in fantasy, therefore their like name values have spiked up in terms of how good they are at the NFL level. But people don't really think like NFL players don't actually think these guys are that good at playing football. They're just awesome at fantasy. My mind started churning and I'm thinking, okay, I think the only two types of players that fit into this category are dudes like uh, mobile quarterbacks, one, because you don't actually have to be a good thrower of the football in order to have a lot of fantasy points in that sense. And then running backs. So it's mobile quarterbacks and running backs and maybe tight ends that score a lot of touchdowns. But those are the two that really came to mind. And the reason for that, like I said, with running backs is volume tends to be the predictive measure of whether or not a running back is good in fantasy. OK, and when an NFL offense runs a play. Right. So say you're this obviously in order to be the starter, you have to separate yourself from the other guys and you have to be at least good or better than the other guys on the depth chart. But let's say an NFL team trots out to run a play. Right. Coach calls a run play you know that the running back is getting a touch there, right? Like you don't actually have to be good at the running back position in order to be the one that gets the touch if they call the run play while you're out there on the field. At the wide receiver position, if they call a pass play, you don't just get the pass. You don't just get the target. You still actually have to be good on the football field. You still have to create separation or be very fast and be able to get down the field and separate over the top. You still have to be a good wide receiver in order to get volume. So I think it's way less likely that you find wide receivers who have a ton of volume or who are really good at fantasy football without actually being good at the NFL level because you still have to earn targets. Whereas a running back doesn't actually have to earn touches outside of like beating out the guy on the depth chart. But once you're onto the field and they're calling run plays, you don't have to earn those those carries, right? You still might go for two yards a carry. But as a wide receiver, you got to earn the targets by separating and being a good route runner, et cetera. Be being able to gain chemistry and have that rapport with your quarterback, you don't need rapport. You don't need chemistry with your quarterback in order to get carries on the NFL football field. So I think it's more difficult. For instance, you look at any of you know the top 15 fantasy wide receivers last year, and you go through the list, and you're like, yeah, those are all really good wide receivers. Those are all actually really good NFL wide receivers. Whereas I don't think the same thing happens when you go through the running back list, okay? Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, Stephon Diggs, A.J. Brown, C.D. Lamb, Jalen Waddell, Amon Ross St. Brown, Amari Cooper, Devonta Smith, Jamar Chase, Christian Kirk, Tyler Lockett, Terry McLaurin, Brandon Ayuk. You can go down past the 15. Mike Evans, T. Higgins, D.K. Metcalf, Garrett Wilson. Like All these guys are very, very good NFL wide receivers. Nobody would argue that, and they end up being the top-scoring fantasy wide receivers, okay? So it's a long-winded way of saying that while, you know, when you get later into the draft, if you need running backs, you're probably looking for guys where you can kind of predict their volume. Wide receivers, I think it's worth looking at efficiency as well to predict whether or not they're going to get that type of volume, okay? And it was just an interesting thought I thought I would share with you guys. So I came pre-tucked. I came pre-flexed. I came ready to yell. So let's eat. First guy up on this list, and I'm cheating a little bit, I guess, but it's Deontay Johnson. He's going off at the 6'10". So technically still in the sixth round, but all the way at the back end of the sixth round, pretty much anywhere you're drafting in the sixth round, you'll be able to get him right now. He is the wide receiver 29. He gets so much volume and he is a fantastic separator. And when you look at, yeah, I know he had a miserable year last year, most of mostly because of Kenny Pickett, but mostly 
also because of the touchdowns. He had zero touchdowns somehow last year on like 145 targets. But I, wa- I wanted to find some like third party metrics of people telling me that he's actually still good and he's still uh, a central part of this offense. And that's what I did. So Jordan Vanek, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's someone who looks at like a lot of coverages, single high, double high coverages, and he lets that kind of analysis dictate um, how good a wide receiver is on his own, which I think is pretty cool and pretty unique, and it's been pretty predictive so far from what I've seen from him. Stat of the day, Kenny Pickett had a clear favorite when seeing single high coverage, but Deontay Johnson's 1.56 yards per hour run is the lowest of any player with over a 30% target share on 100 routes run. But I think the takeaway here is you look at Kenny Pickett throwing to Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, Pat Firemuth. He has a very, very clear preferred option here. And it's likely because Deontay Johnson creates insane separation. And this is another chart to back it up. Wide receiver tracking data and first reads. Deontay Johnson is all the way over there to the right, right underneath Stefan Diggs in terms of first read target share and then overall score via ESPN. In his first three seasons in the NFL, he scored five, seven, and eight touchdowns. Last year, he scored zero. Tweet from Alex Caruso. Deontay Johnson has finished top seven in wide receiver targets for three straight years and just put up the highest ESPN getting open score in the NFL. I don't really know what the fuck that means. It seems pretty self-explanatory. I don't know if it's predictive, but getting open. Deontay Johnson, a great route runner. Uh, We're kind of finding out that, you know, just getting open may not be enough to be like an elite NFL wide receiver, but the dude has had at least 144 targets in three straight seasons. He's very clearly the number one target for Kenny Pickett in the offense because he gets open. And this is one of the craziest stats that Alex found. He saw 44% of his team's end zone targets when he was on the field last year. He had zero touchdowns, saw 44% of his team's end zone targets. That number is going to skyrocket this year. He's probably still going to be the number one in that offense. George Pickens, I to me, I've always seen him as like a Mike Williams type. I've always seen him as like a downfield playmaker type. I don't think George Pickens will ever be the alpha in this offense. Deontay Johnson will continue to be the alpha from a target standpoint. Number two, Mike Evans. You want to talk about a fucking alpha? This is the guy. You want to talk about a guy? You want to talk about a guy who started his career with nine straight seasons of 1,000 receiving yards. He's going in the seventh round as the wide receiver 31. I get it. You don't want him as your fourth round pick, your fifth round pick. I don't either. But seventh round, I'm. Mean, what else does his offense have? It feels like we're overthinking the shit out of this. Kind of feels similar to the Seattle situation last year where no one was drafting Geno. We didn't even know who the starting quarterback was. Was it going to be Geno? Was it going to be... um? I don't know, Tony, you could put it up. I can't, that's how bad that fucking dude is. I can't even think of who the other uh, quarterback was that was getting some hype to be the other starter. Lockett and Metcalf seem like Godwin and uh, Mike Evans right now. Like DK last year was like the wide receiver 21. Lockett last year was the wide receiver 41. And now you have Godwin going as the 22 and Evans as the 31. And I think it could be an underrated offense. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I don't hate Baker Mayfield. I definitely don't hate Mike Evans. I don't even hate Chris Godwin this year. I actually like all three of those dudes where they're going in drafts right now. And I think it could be an extremely condensed offense where most of the targets just go to those guys. But Mike Evans in the seventh round feels nuts to me. And there's another player going in the seventh round. That's Traylon Burks at the 7-11 wide receiver 35 second year player for the Tennessee Titans. Now last year's flop was incredibly predictable. Everything out of camp last year was cryptic about Traylon Burks in the summer. And I kept saying that in my videos, I was like, he was, he seemed to me to be the easiest fade ever last year, right? And everyone just kept being like, nah, there's you're being stupid because the same thing happened with Jamar Chase. No. Y'all were fucking stupid. Go back to the go back to my my fade list videos of last year and go look at the comments about Trey Lombards. Y'all embarrassed yourselves. He was out of shape. He was dealing with uh, toe injuries. He had asthma problems, all of that shit. Okay. And now is when you buy Trey Burks at the seven 11, because he's not coming into the year injured. And every report out of camp so far is absolutely on flames. There's a different swagger with Burks who reported to the facility with a noticeably leaner build. He's playing at a different speed from his rookie season. Burks said that the difference this season is he's in, be- he's in better shape and the numerous plays he has made during OTA's mini camp are evidence. And you could just see all these reports, you know, just kind of like piling on top of each other. It's something I always say throughout the offseason where there's smoke, there's fire. When you continue to hear reports from beat reporters, teammates, quarterbacks, coaches, whatever, there's usually something there. And Traylon Burks seems like the most obvious case of that. Like, I can see a world where Traylon Burks has like a 28% target share. I don't know if he's going to be efficient on it, but a 28% target share, like they have literally 
nobody else in this offense, man. Like, it is Nick Westbrook-Akini. Uh, Racy McMath is like the wide receiver three. It is insane how bad the depth chart is here. He's going to be force-fed targets. So even in a low-volume passing offense, he's a guy who gets high-value targets. So his targets are worth more than like a slot guy who were to get 100 targets. I think Traylon Burks is an easy bet to get 115, 125 targets this year. As the one in this offense, he's a talented player. Remember, he was a first-round pick who they got rid of A.J. Brown to try to replace with, obviously, in hindsight, awful move by them. But love Traylon Burks at the 7-11. I just don't see a world where he's not leading this team by far and away in targets. So we move from the seventh round to the eighth round. Jahan Dotson, the second-year wide receiver, also a first-round pick at the 805 wide receiver 38. He had a weirdly high average depth of target. I think when you think of Jahan Dotson, you think of an underside receiver who's probably getting like slot targets or probably getting a lot of like slant targets. His A dot was really, really high up there. It was like top 12 in the NFL last year. He's a downfield playmaker as well as a possession catch guy. He's an unbelievable route runner. He's an unbelievable separator as well. If you go look at any of Matt Harmon's reception perception data, he's a dude who gets off the line of scrimmage quickly and has a ton of success against man and press coverage, which is usually an indicator or predictive of success at the NFL level when it comes to wide receivers. This is a tweet from my man Corey Bush over there at the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Jahan Dotson scored 13.96 PPR points per game in his nine fully healthy games in 2022. That would have been wide receiver 20 behind Christian Kirk just ahead of Jerry Judy. As a rookie with Heineke and Wentz in the second slowest offense in the NFL year two, you've got some kind of combination of Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett and offensive coordinator, new offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy, um, are all bull factors, I guess. Now, I don't like nitpicking things. I don't like nitpicking stats and stuff when it comes to like small sample size of the NFL. But I think it's pretty clear when you watch Jahan Dotson play, when you saw what he did in his limited sample size, he's at worst a, a very good second wide receiver. And that's what he'll be behind Terry McLaurin, no doubt about it. But this is another offense where I could see this being a condensed offense. Curtis Samuel's like had his run. They've had he's had his chance to be the the guy in this offense. Very rarely ever actually like makes the impact at this level um, that any of the teams that continue to sign him want him to be. So Dotson again, just the first round guy that has proven after last year to be skilled enough to succeed and play at this NFL level and play at a very high level. Uh, I, I'm I'm very much in at Jahan Dotson at the 805. We're actually gonna go bike into the seventh round because I don't know why I listed him this way. But Christian Kirk is a seventh-round pick this year. Jacksonville Jaguars at the 703, wide receiver 32. He feels a lot like Tyler Lockett right now, where we're just going to underrate him every single year because we never see like a wide receiver, a top five wide receiver ceiling, but he can consistently just go for a thousand yards year in and year out. Like last year, his first year out of Arizona, first year in Jacksonville, set career highs across the board, 133 targets, 84 catches, 1,108 receiving yards, eight touchdowns, and career high in fantasy points per game. He was the wide receiver 12 last year in fantasy. He was like an actual wide receiver one. And listen, I've been on the record. I love Calvin Ridley this year. I definitely would take Ridley straight up over Christian Kirk, and I'm willing to draft him at a high ADP. But when you play fantasy, you have to think in the range of outcomes. Like, if, Rid if Ridley is great, cool. Kirk will probably still be fine. If Ridley just isn't, right, he's had this prolonged absence. Maybe Calvin Ridley isn't who he was anymore, and he isn't going to be the guy that a lot of people project him to be. If he's not, then Kirk is probably going to be great again for this offense. Now, them two are very different types of players. They needed a player like Calvin Ridley because Calvin Ridley throughout his time in Atlanta was an 80 to 85% outside guy. He's an outside separator. Christian Kirk is a 70 to 75% slot guy, right? They're two different players. You have Trevor Lawrence, who's about to enter his prime. That's a scary thought. And when you look at last year, like that was their first year in the new offense. It was the first year outside of the toxic offense they had two years ago. Here are their rankings as a team last year. Seventh in total yards per game on offense. Eighth fastest pace. Ninth in points per game. Ninth in yards per play. Ninth in pass attempts per game. Tenth in red zone scoring attempts per game. Tenth in passing yards per game. Those are incredible metrics given how bad they were two years ago and having their first year with Trevor Lawrence under a normal coach in this new offense. I can't imagine what they're going to do in year two, adding Ridley to the offense. Kirk in the seventh round feels like the easiest Tyler Lockett type pick over the next three years in a row. So if you don't have any wide receivers yet, and you're still looking for your wide receiver one or your wide receiver two, Kirk is going to put you up a healthy eight to 10 minimum points per week at the wide receiver position. And you will not be disappointed that you drafted him. Will he have 27 point games? I don't know, but you're not really looking for that when you get into the seventh, eighth, ninth round. The likelihood of those guys happening, 
Very, very small. So grab guys that you know are going to be efficient. Grab guys that you have seen be really good at fantasy football and grab guys that are attached to high volume, high scoring offenses with really good quarterbacks. And Christian Kirk absolutely fits that bill. So those are the five dudes that I absolutely love in round seven or later if you faded the wide receiver position in fantasy drafts this year. Quick recap, we have Deontay Johnson who is going off the board at the 6'10". We have Mike Evans going off the board at the 702. We've got Traylon Burks going off the board at the 711. Jahan Dotson at the 805. And Christian Kirk at the 703. Go check out the running back version of this video if you did not already do that. I'm also going to do this with the quarterback and the tight end position probably next week's two videos. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I'm about to hop on Underdog and do a super flex draft. Uh, we stream those, so hit the notification button down below if you're not already getting noticed so you know when we go live for those streams. I love y'all. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see y'all tomorrow for another live stream.